Right on. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Everybody that's here, welcome. It's cold out there. Get tired of that. I um, want to welcome everybody on YouTube also. Make sure to like, subscribe, hit notifications. Uh, I think the video typically goes up mid-afternoon on Sunday. Um, and if you're here, go ahead and watch the video too. Like and subscribe. Share, because we have the e easiest way to share the gospel right now is just to share a video. It's a simple thing. So be sure and do that. You going to pray us in and sure. again? Yes. <laughs> Once again, welcome everyone on YouTube. We've already prayed here, but we're going to pray again so everyone can pray with us. We want to invite everyone to worship, even if you're at home right now, you can... Uh, you can, right where you're at, you can worship God because if you're a born-again believer, God is right there with you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. So right now, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much once again for a time and place to just stop all the other things we're doing this week and spend time with you. So Father, right now, I pray, send your Holy Spirit in us in this place. Be here, usher in a worship of you, Father. Give us a heart of thanksgiving that we can worship you with. And help us to really, really reach out to you and, and seek you this morning through worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>
wants to sing a song this morning? to heaven Listen to the angels sing along the Song of your faithfulness Song of your grace And of your loving kindness To the glory of your name Everything that's in me, Lord Listen to me sing I want to sing a song for you I want to sing a song you Lord Lord for you I want to live my life I want to praise the name of Jesus pray above all things you're glorified song of your faithfulness song of your grace of your loving kindness to the glory of your name everything me, Lord, listen to me sing. I want to sing a song for you. I want to sing a song, a song of your faithfulness, a song of your grace, and of your loving kindness to the glory of your name. With everything that's in you, Lord, listen to me sing. I want to sing a song for you. I want to sing a song. And we'll sing. Holy, holy. We'll sing holy, holy, holy. And we'll sing holy, holy. this next song because it it describes God's love in a way that I don't think maybe we think of it it describes it as fierce his love for you is fierce I mean he loves us so much that I think we underestimate how much he loves us I really do and his love is it's as fierce as anything in nature that's why it like compares it to tidal waves and hurricanes that's how fierce his love is for you. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross for us. Amen. For having a fierce love for those who are called by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Okay, I think we're ready. Okay, welcome to church once again. Woo, who enjoyed worship today? I really enjoyed it. Amen. Thank the praise band for letting me be up there. We want to welcome everyone watching remotely on YouTube. We appreciate having the ability to reach you that way. We hope you appreciate it as well. Uh, I said we would be starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this week, and we will. And with that said, who read their Bibles this week? Raise your hand. Okay. You didn't have to read the chapter, but it's always better if you at least read that one and maybe some more, right? And if you didn't raise your hand and you didn't read your Bible, you cheated yourself again. But, you know, we're not that far into 2022. This is the last Sunday, though. So January's over, pretty much. And, you know, you could say, well, I cheated myself in January, but that's it. The rest of the year, I'm reading my Bible every week. You could do that, right? Amen. Yeah, heck, I know you could. I got faith in you. And if you need prayer for help doing that, come on up and we'll pray for you. So we're going to go through the book of First Corinthians one chapter a week. Uh, maybe we might get more than one sermon out of a chapter. We'll just see what God has in store for us, but we're, it's going to take us a while. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church uh, at Corinth. I think he was in Ephesus when he wrote it. All indications tell us that. And I started researching Corinth a little bit, and it's, it's a pretty impressive place. Uh, uh, this, it's, a, it's a city in Greece, uh, back when Greece was under Roman control at this time. Um, it was a major center for trade. So I'm going to geek out just a little bit here because I love history. I love geography. I love interesting facts. And I found out some interesting facts about Corinth. So I'm not going to teach a history lesson. You can wake up when I'm done if you hate history, okay? But I'm going to geek out for a second. Uh, the Isthmian games were held just outside of Corinth every two years. And they're just like the Olympian games. The Olympics were held every four years, even back then. And then on, the two years, on a two-year cycle was the Ithmian games. And they were held at a different time of the year. So even when they hit the same year as the Olympics, they still went on. And they were every two years, so they were kind of more frequent maybe. It was a, a great time for the people from Athens to have rivalry with the people from Corinth, you know, being from... But everyone was invited uh, to these games. Uh, they, they were a pretty big deal. They were held just outside the city at Poseidon's temple. Poseidon's that Greek god with the, the trident. You know, he's the god of the sea, that they false god that they worshipped. Um, and so that, that was that. But the other interesting tidbit about this is the let's see if I can pronounce this Greek word the dilokos dilokos which was basically a stone railway they believe it's probably the first use of a rail system even though there, it didn't have rails I'll get to that in a second uh, it was just outside the city too because Corinth in the peninsula of Greece is at the narrowest point there's four miles across and to take a ship all the way around was like 400 miles. And if you could cut across four miles, so they actually built a stone road, and then they carved 
channels in the stone that the wagon wheels could ride on, and they actually brought ships up out of the water, put them on these wagons or train cars, rolled them the four miles, then put them back in. <laughs> Think about that, because, I mean, it take like less than a day to, to go across, or you're going to take like a week, you know, so... And they would also just cargo goods that way. One ship would meet up here, and a ship would drop them off here, and they'd take them that four miles. But, I mean, and that's just outside the city. So, I mean, Corinth is like a pretty important geographical place there. Uh, that's kind of my geeking out a little bit about Corinth. Uh, there is now a actual canal there. It's the Canal of Corinth. It was built in the 1800s, so not that long ago. They actually dug a canal, and ships can go through there. It's not wide enough for the big ships today, so it's not used quite like it would have been back then. Uh, but if you think about the cultural influence on a place like that, that had all that stuff going on, people coming from all over for the games every two years, every day ships going across, being pulled across on that, railway system and all the trade that would bring and all the people and the influence and the melting pot, right, that would be going on in a place like that. Almost like a port city, but even better than a port city, kind of, in a way. And all the people that were employed by that road that pulled the ships, because they pulled them by hand, they're guessing, took about a hundred people. Is what the, They don't know. The records are lost, obviously, but part of the road's still there. But, I mean... What a place to evangelize. The Apostle Paul knew what he was doing. When he planted this church in Corinth, I mean, he had a plan. Amen? God had a plan. God knew. If you get a church, a powerful Christian church in a place like that, you can spread throughout the world. Well, I guess it worked. Here we are. Christianity spread throughout the world. Amen? So I, I geek out about things like that. Uh, and we, we read when we went through the book of Acts, and you can go back and read it, and you should, in chapter 18 when Paul actually planted the church in Corinth. So read chat, uh, Acts chapter 18. It's kind of a supplement. Uh, and this letter really is Paul from another place, from Ephesus, writing to instruct the church at Corinth because he couldn't be there. He was going on planting more churches. But he was getting word back to him of stuff that was going on. And he, so he's instructing and he's dealing with some problems. They got some problems. Who's got problems? We all got problems. Why do we have problems? We're human, right? We make mistakes. And uh, they didn't necessarily have, they didn't have the book of 1 Corinthians back then. Paul hadn't wrote it. And then when he wrote it, he sent it to them and then they had it. Now we have it, right? So the title of the sermon today is No God. And not N-O, God, K-N-O-W, to know who God is. So know God. So it seems to me that, uh, as I read through the chapter a few times, the gist of this first chapter is to bolster uh, the, your understanding of who God is. Okay? And he starts out, Paul starts out with, uh, with an introduction and a blessing, and then by verse 10 he's gotten to correction mode. He's already wants to start dealing with a few things that he has gotten back to him. And we'll, we'll get to that verse. And, uh, you know, that's something I think we're going to have to get used to as we go through the book of Corinthians, is Paul correct, correcting us, correcting things that shouldn't be going on, you know. So we'll get used to it. Uh, and remember, Paul knows these people personally, many of them. He was there for probably a year. He knows, and he knows he can't patty cake right? These, these are tough people. These are people who are influenced by everything, by the Greek gods, by religions from all over the world, by inside and outside forces. He can't patty cake around, and he doesn't. He's very direct when he's instructing. He's like, knock that off. Don't do that anymore. You know what I'm saying? And I think we'll also get used to that direct nature. I think we'll notice that as we go along. So the title is No God. Let us bow our heads and pray and get right into the chapter. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we, we thank you for your word, uh, your Bible. What an awesome thing you did just to preserve it all through the ages, right here to where we're at now. You preserved your word. 
Why did you do that? Because you knew it was so important for us and you love us. So now, Father, help us to value your word that you put all that effort into preserving for us and writing to us. Help us to value it. And right now, I would pray that you would anoint my lips to preach your word, your teaching. Give us all ears to hear it with and a heart to receive it with. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll start out in verse 1. I think we should read verse 1 because it's the beginning of the book and and it's, it identifies Paul. So it says, Paul, right on, very first word, we know who wrote the book, right? Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and so seen, seen us our brother. So Paul likes to recognize his secretary. This is probably the guy he dictated it to and the guy that actually wrote it. So nice of him to give him a shout out. We don't know a lot about him, but Paul obviously did. Verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, so we know exactly who he's writing to, saved people. And then he also says, with all that, that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, so that's to you and me too, our Lord, both theirs and ours. He's writing it to Corinth, but he says, you know what? This applies to all believers, wherever they're at. Verse 3, we'll read that one too. Because he's very nice here. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I mean, a very nice introduction. Um, so, we said no God. Some things to know here in this chapter First thing you should know is if you are saved. He says, this, I'm writing to the, those who are called, those who are sanctified, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to everyone who is saved. So if the first thing to know, know if you're saved, right? Skip down to verse 8. He says, who shall also, he's talking about God and Jesus, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God has the power to, keep, to save you, to keep you blameless. If you're saved, you're blameless. You understand that, right? You, not of any of your own doing. You, you did bad things. Who knows they've done bad things called sin. Hopefully we all know that we have. God can make you blameless. He can forgive those sins. And he does when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He has the power to do that. Verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So he has the power and God is faithful. So let's think about what we know. You know if you're saved. That's the first thing he wants you to know. Then you know it's God that keeps you that way. And the reason he does that is because he is faithful. God is faithful. Faithful and true. If God says something, he will do it. God's not going to back out on you. God's not going to say, well, I was going to forgive you, but now that I found out how bad you really are, I change my mind. <laughs> you evil sin sack, right? <laughs> it's not God. He's faithful. He says he's going to forgive you. He's going to forgive you. That's how it works, okay? Verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So now he's, he's getting into, he's going to deal with a problem. So we are called to be Christ's witness. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said at the end of the book of Mark. He says, you be my witnesses to the uttermost part of the world, right? Saving and baptizing. And so if that's, that's our call as, as Christians, to be Christ's witness, if that's the case, we can't have contentions amongst ourselves. You see what I mean? That's not Christ's witness. If we're always fighting with one another, that, that doesn't portray the witness of Christ and, and God's love. You know, God doesn't... God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, they're not fighting against each other. You see what I mean? God's witness is love and harmony, right? 
We're supposed to love each other enough where we can get along with other, each other. We don't go around telling people how good God is and how bad our brother in Christ is. You see what I mean? Oh, yeah, God's good. Oh, yeah, but man, that dude at church, he is an a-hole. You know? <laughs> That's not the witness of Christ. <laughs> you, see that? you say, yes, uh, God is so good. He saved me from so much. And, and well, what about that guy at church? You know, he's a really good guy. Well, he came off wrong to me. Well, you just don't know him well enough. Because I know him, and he's a really good guy. He really loves God. What a difference. What a witness for Christ. Amen? Because we're probably all jerks or a holes at some time and to somebody and first impressions mean a lot to humans amen and i'm sure i've made some bad ones bad first impressions but hopefully somebody was there to defend me and say ah he's just having a bad day he's probably not as bad as you think i'd like to think that hopefully <laughs> i'd do it for you okay so that's what he's getting across. He's like, hey, uh, we've got to get along here. You're, you're supposed to be witnesses. Verse 11. He says, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So he's just mentioning the person who's getting word back to him. Someone's getting word back to him, whether he's writing a letter, whether he made a trip. Someone's getting word back to Paul about some stuff that's going on. He says, it's been brought to my attention that you guys aren't getting along. There's problems. And here's what the problems are. Let's read on. Now, this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. And then, so then he asks the question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he's, it's apparently they're going around and saying, well, I, I heard the gospel from Paul. I don't know about you. you know. And then, well, I was with Cephas, which would be Peter. You know, Peter's above Paul, isn't he? He's been, well, I was with Apollo, so I guess I'll go with that gospel. And that's not the point. Paul's like... Do we cut Christ up into little pieces? So it seems that they were missing the whole point. Church leaders are not the point of the gospel. Did you know that? I'm not the point of the gospel. Whoever Johnny, Pastor Johnny, when he's up here preaching, he's not the point. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is always the point. And teachers in the church aren't supposed to be rivals. You know, I like it when Johnny preaches. Well, I'd rather have Pastor Todd. That's not what it's about. We're not rivals. We're not trying to outdo one another. We're in this together. We're partners. You see what I mean? And, and so are you. And so uh, they really, really were missing the point. And, and quite honestly, I mean, there's so many TV evangelists. There's TV preachers. There's... And, you know, there's been some prominent ones, even in our area, up Lester Summerall, up, right up in South Bend. And, um, but here's some advice. If you link yourself up to a human teacher, you're leading down the road to problems. If the teacher was who you were linked to. Because eventually, something's going to happen. I mean, they're going to be human. They're going to make a mistake, which has happened to a lot of preachers we've seen. Or they're going to die. I mean, they get old, you know. I, you, so to link yourself up really to a human teacher, it can cause problems. And if there's more than one teacher in a church, it can cause divisions in a church. Well, I like pastor so-and-so. Well, I like some churches have ten pastors. You know what I mean? Like these big mega churches, and you can just imagine what could go on in a place like that. 20,000 people going to a church with 20 pastors. You could really have some divisions. Well, I don't like that pastor. What do you mean? You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's an important problem that Paul's getting at here. And it also works within us as humans with cliques. You remember school where we had cliques, right? And uh, why, do, why do we have cliques? Do you know why? I can tell you why. To make ourselves elevated, to feel more important. 
because we're always part of the better click, right? Well, we don't talk to those people. We're better than them. Okay, it can happen in churches too, and I think it was happening in Corinth. There was clicks, clicks, and there was, well, he can't be a part of our Bible study group because he didn't get baptized by Paul. You know, who knows, but it was not good. So, you know, are you Christian? What does the word say? Christ? So whose are you? Christ. Okay, you're not Pastor Todd's. You're not John, Pastor Johnny's. You're not the Apostle Paul's. You are the Lord Jesus Christ's child. Okay, the word is Christian. Okay, let's skip down to verse 22. Verse 22, and we will talk about, and we'll look at a little bit, human expectations. Okay? You know they play into your life, your expectations? 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay? Human expectations. The Jews want God to show them something. That's, that's what a sign is. Show me God. Show me something. It's an expectation. That's what they were looking for with Jesus, right? But they didn't, he didn't show them what they wanted. They wanted a military leader that would make them dominant. And that's not who Jesus was. And they, right? Disappointed. Why? Because of their expectation. And the Greeks, what does it say? The Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks want to figure things out logically. You see what I'm saying? So... Seeking after wisdom. 23, let's read on. But, Paul says, but that's not what we preach. We're not preaching logically, and I'm not preaching a military leader for the Jews. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews it's a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks it's foolishness. But we preach it, and that's what we preach. So, you know, it was, there's a quote I found when I was researching and this was a quote about Paul, and it's, it's a, it, there's no credit given to who quoted it, but it says, Paul was not a sign-loving Jew, nor a wisdom-seeking Greek. Instead, he was a Savior-loving Christian. That's who Paul was. He wasn't seeking a sign. He wasn't logically trying to figure it out. He just loved Jesus Christ. And that's what you can be, Christian. Uh, Christ crucified was not the sign the Jews were looking for, and someone dying, like Jesus Christ crucified, he died on the cross. Someone dying to save you didn't add up logically to the Greeks. They're like, what? How's he going to save me if he's dead? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Yet, Christ is the Savior of the world. So human expectations don't change what God does or who he is. Amen? Know that about God. That's pretty important. Uh, 24, let's read on. A couple more verses, I think, yeah. But unto them, so, stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Greeks, but unto them which are called, the saved, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, you know, remember, the Jews were looking for the power, the military leader, the dominance. Well, once they're saved, Christ is the power of God displayed to mankind. And, of course, the Greeks who were looking for that knowledge, once they're saved, God is the, the wisdom. So it, and I like that he lumps them together, Greeks or Jews. It doesn't matter who you were before. Those who hear the call of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the power and the wisdom of God. Amen. doesn't matter who you were, where you came from. One more verse, and I'll finish. Verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the wickedness of God is stronger than men. Men, don't let this verse confuse you, okay? There is actually neither foolishness nor wickedness in God. God has no wickedness in him. 
God has no foolishness in him. The point being made is it seems like that from, from certain human vantage points. From the vantage point of a human who's unsaved, it could seem like that's nothing but nonsense. Okay? From the vantage point, you know, it, but in actuality, none of that. So this is what reality is. God's wisdom and power surpasses human understanding. Okay? It doesn't matter what your vantage point is, even if you're saved. It not only passes human understanding, it passes human imagination. You can't even imagine how powerful and how smart God is. He's got all the power and all the knowledge. We can't quite imagine that. We can, you know, we can fantasize it. We can write fictional books and we can come up with, but you, you, you can't. It, we don't possess that in us. So, so rem, remember the title was No God, K-N-O-W. Let's see how well you know the chapter. Let me give you a chapter test. Ready for a chapter test? I got some questions. Calm down. <laughs> it's only five questions. It's more like a quiz. Let me give you a quiz. Let's see if you know God. Okay, do you know God? You, in order to really know God, to really know him, you must be saved. Paul established that right up in the front. Okay. Do you keep or maintain your salvation? No, you don't keep or maintain it. God does. Right? God keeps it. Why? Why does God do that? You're right, you would. But God does it because he's faithful. Paul said that. But we would. We'd mess it up. I'll guarantee it. John was right on the money. If God said, okay, here it is, now keep it safe. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> God's way smarter than that. Okay, way smarter than that. Okay. All right. Uh, another question. Is Christ divided? Is there division in the Lord Jesus Christ? No. No, 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 no. Christ is not divided, so the church or the body of Christ, which we're supposed to be the body of Christ, we're not divided either. We don't, we're not supposed to have contentions and fightings and quarrelings and disagreements, okay? Does it matter who led you to Christ? No. It didn't matter if you got saved when Pastor Johnny preached a sermon, or you got saved when I did, or Pastor Mark, or Lester Summerall you watched on TV, or whatever. It doesn't matter who led you to Christ. Christ is always the point of everything taught in a Christian church. Do you understand that? Jesus Christ is always...